As a kid, a sort of dream I always had was to someday be on TV. And today, that has finally happened. I've finally hit the big screen. Or in this case, the little screen. In today's video, we're going to take a look at a tiny TV that was a big leap forward in electronic miniaturization. From 1982, this is the Sony Watchman Portable TV, model FD210. This is something I found on eBay back in the summertime, uh, and it was a really lucky find. This thing works absolutely perfect, um, and the only cosmetic flaw it has is it's got a crack in the case right there, and also it's got a stand on the back to prop it up, and that's partially broken as well, but this thing is functionally 100% absolutely perfect, and I paid only $16 for this on eBay. Um, and that's incredibly um, lucky because um, of all the Sony Watchman models and, and portable TVs in general, this is one of the most coveted ones. I, these are really collectible. You don't find them often on eBay. In fact, as, as of um, making this video, there aren't any on eBay right now. Um, and at most, there's only two or three at, at any given time. And, you know, in good shape, these usually go for $50, $75. Um, a boxed one will go for over $100. Um, these go for quite a lot of money, and I'm not sure why, but I managed uh, to get this one for $16. So I think that's um, just uh, incredibly lucky. Um, ever since I first heard that the Sony Watchmen or, or pocket-sized portable TVs in general existed, which has been for almost 10 years now, this was the one model that I always wanted. And um, I didn't get one until this summer for that reason, they, that, um, they just go for too much money. And uh, I eventually quenched my thirst um, with another much more common, much cheaper Watchman model, the FD30, which you've seen me make a video of before. But uh, yeah, over the summer I decided I, I wanted to take a look again, see if I could get me one of these, you know, before they all disappear forever. And uh, boy, I got lucky, so I'm really happy. You know, people had been trying to make a miniature TV since the 1960s, is pretty much when development started, and um, in those early days, the best you got was something based on, you know, a 4-inch or 5-inch CRT that weighed several pounds and definitely wasn't pocket-sized at all, you know, ran on a, on a large number of big heavy batteries like D-cells or whatever. And it really wasn't until the uh, 1970s that um, people started figuring out how to make a TV that was small enough to hold in one hand, you know, and to use in the hand or um, put in your pocket. Now granted, this isn't what we would consider pocket size today, but um, if you had big enough pockets, it was pocket size. Um, and one of the big names in the early portable TV business were Panasonic. Panasonic um, made a number of um, handheld size TVs starting in the 1970s and they were quite popular. They ran on AA batteries and um, and uh, they were generally quite nice and very portable indeed. The issue though um, that people just couldn't figure out how to solve was that um, for as big as as these early you know handheld slash pocket TVs, I'm gonna call them mini miniature TVs um, just for for um, for simplicity from here on out. The issue with these early miniature TVs was that for as big as they were, they had an absolutely tiny screen on them. Um, they used a black and white CRT display, just a, you know, a conventional CRT tube, but miniaturized. Um, and so the issue was, um, despite how big and heavy these things were, you were lucky if you got one with a one and a half inch size screen, a, a, a postal stamp size screen. And that's because, you know, a CR, the CRT was the biggest component in these things. And despite, you know, having a tiny display, um, the CRT itself would be several inches long. The neck would go back a long ways. It was just um, inherent in the, in the design of the CRT tube itself. And so um, 
starting in the 1970s, companies were trying to think up, you know, how do we shrink the CRT itself while keeping the actual display a reasonable size? Because, you know, who wants to watch a post-it stamp size screen? And sort of the funny thing is Panasonic had a um, sort of a unique solution to this with the TVs they sold, which had a 1.5, 1.4 inch screen. They sold it with a little clip-on uh, magnifying glass that you clip onto the front of the display and it would magnify it up to like two inches or something like that. Well, when Sony was developing their own miniature TV, they came up with an absolutely ingenious idea. Um, just totally absurd, but it worked and it worked very, very well. And that was they totally changed the structure of the CRT rather than, you know, trying to do something to shrink the neck length of, this, of the CRT, they just totally did something completely different, completely radical for the CRT itself. Now, this has, again, it's a black and white CRT display. It is two inches in size. And if you take a look at this, um, the CRT only goes, the, it only goes this deep. And the reason is because Unlike an ordinary CRT where um, the electron gun is perpendicular to the viewing display and the electron gun fires the electrons on the back of the viewing display, in the special radical CRT that Sony designed for the Watchmen, the electron gun's actually down here in the bottom. The electron gun is actually placed per, uh, parallel to the display and so the electrons are fired almost parallel to the display, but the electron gun, although it's parallel to the display, it's raised just very slightly above the display. So it's firing the electrons slightly downwards so that they reach the display. And uh, with this, Sony was able to create what they called a flat CRT. Um, and as you can see, it is flat indeed still very long but now that length is parallel to the viewing display instead of perpendicular to it and so now you can have a portable tv um, with a larger display but it's not super thick or super long to accommodate a standard crt so this was just absolutely um, ingenious of sony to do now with this um the radical design of the CRT um, does introduce a couple of new problems. First of all, um, because of the way the electron gun is arranged um, with reference to the actual phosphor screen, um, some very radical geometry correction has to be done in order for the picture to show up correctly. Because the bottom of the phosphor screen is closer to the electron gun than the top of the phosphor screen, which isn't really a, an issue in a normal CRT. If a normal um, sort of geometry system was used, um, it would result in a very uh, sharply trapezoid shaped display. Um, the bottom of it would be quite narrow and then the top of it very um, wide because um, the top of the screen is farther away from the electron gun. So uh, there has to be very strong um, trapezoid correction done to the geometry. And there were a couple other things that had to be done as well. And this made the special CRT used in these TVs um, a bit harder to calibrate at the factory in preparation for shipping. Um, and it, it made them a bit harder and a bit more expensive to manufacture. So although the image quality of this CRT is very good um, relative to other tiny CRTs, which I'll demonstrate in this video, you can tell just how difficult it was to get the geometry right when you watch one of these and you look at the display, you'll see that the raster looks a bit wobbly and um, there's some things that don't look right and, and um, things are a bit curvy. You know, a straight line on the display might look a little bit uh, wavy. Um, and that's just an inherent difficulty of the design of the CRT. It was super hard to get the geometry perfect on them. Well, it was impossible to get it perfect, but um, it was also very hard to get it, you know, to look passable. But Sony did it, and um, 
Overall, these Sony Watchmans, there were tons of models of these. The FD210, this unit, was the first um, model introduced in 1982. Um, but Sony introduced, oh my gosh, probably 20 or 30 different models of Watchmen, all based on this same type of CRT display. Up until about 1994-95 was when the last models were um, discontinued. So Sony got a lot of mileage off this special CRT and um, all of the CRT Watchmans, all of them, not only do they have a very decent quality picture for a TV of this tiny size, um, but they're all very reliable. Um, almost every CRT based Sony Watchman you'll find on eBay or whatever works just fine. Um, even, you know, this very earliest unit pushing, you know, it'll be 40 years old in a in a few years. Um, these just don't die. They really don't need any maintenance or anything. They work just fine. They're aging incredibly well. Um, as opposed to the, the Casio LCD based TVs that are just, it's hard to find a working one now. They've all died of old age. These things are still trucking along. It's super easy and cheap to get one of these perfect working if you want one, and I think that's really excellent. Um, like any TV, these have a lot of capacitors and stuff in them, and I can only guess that, you know, sometime down the road, I don't know, it could be only a few years from now, or it could be another 20 years, I have no idea. Someday those capacitors have got to get to a point where this thing's just going to start having problems, but hopefully that doesn't happen for a long time. But yeah, as of making this video, it's super easy. You can, pretty much every model of Sony Watchmen based on the CRT, they just don't break. They don't break and they don't wear out or go out of calibration or whatever or anything it's really really nice so for a vintage electronics collector these are pretty much one of the cheapest easiest things to get if you want one which is really nice at least for you know most almost all of the watchman models one or two of them including the fd210 um, obviously isn't as cheap or easy to find like i said there's actually none on ebay right now which even surprised me Going back to the CRT, it wasn't only this 2-inch um, type that Sony made. Um, Sony made a lot of CRT Watchmans with different sizes of displays. They later had ones based on a 2.5-inch display, a 3-inch display, and the largest they made was a 4-inch display, all based on this same flat CRT design. However, the CRT used in the FD210 is a totally unique type from the rest of the Watchmans. Um, this was the only model that Sony used this exact type of CRT in and for all subsequent models they changed the design quite a bit and um, I'll show you another Watchman here to explain what I'm talking about. Here's an, uh, another one I have. It's a Sony Watchman FD30. This is a slightly newer one from 1984 and uh, still it's got the 2 inch flat CRT display. But if you look at these you'll notice something quite different about them. You'll see that while the FD210 has a totally flat screen, the FD30 the screen is curved. You can see it's tilted and it's curved. And so when you're watching the TV you actually watch it at an angle here rather than straight up. And um, yeah, Sony changed, you know, after the FD210 so when you change the CRT design, they tilted the screen up and they um, made it a bit curved here. And rather than having the electron gun set just slightly above the phosphor screen, now they put it directly in line of the phosphor screen. It didn't have to be slightly above it anymore because now the screen is tilted slightly upwards. Comparing these two TVs, I'm not sure why Sony made this design change because um, as it turns out, the earlier design used in the FD210 is far superior. The image quality is way better. Um, particularly the geometry and the contrast, they are way better. Um, and so I find this very surprising and it leads me to wonder why they changed the design um, to this inferior design. And my guess would be cost. My guess is whatever changes they made um, made it cheaper, maybe easier to manufacture 
the CRT. Sort of an interesting difference is, is that while all other CRT watchmans have brightness and contrast controls, the FT210 doesn't. There is no brightness and no contrast control, and despite that, the picture looks perfect. And like I said, way better quality than the later CRT watchmans. Um, so my guess is the lack of the user having to change the contrast or brightness um, probably made it harder to manufacture because all that stuff had to be calibrated at the factory. But yeah, it's too bad because this CRT um, has a way better picture than the later ones with the curved screen. Um, but whatever Sony, whatever reason Sony had, you know, they were probably legitimate. But yeah, I thought that was very interesting nonetheless. Sony also later introduced color Watchmans, later in the Watchmans life. Not based on a CRT, however, they were based on an LCD. Um, it was beginning in 1989 or 1990, Sony introduced the first color Watchman, the model FDL uh, 310, which was based on an active matrix color LCD display. And um, Sony made color Watchmans up until about 2000, and they discontinued the last ones. Sadly, the early Sony color Watchmans, like the FDL 310, the FDL 320, uh, the FDL 3500, um, it is hard to find one of those working now. Like most Sony electronics from the early 90s, they have since long died of uh, bad capacitors. Sony used really poor quality um, capacitors in the early 90s. Um, like that camcorder I had, the, the uh, Handycam CCD F501, that died of bad capacitors. That was from 1991, I believe. Um, those Sony Color Watchmans, um, it's just really hard to um, find working ones because they've mostly died off of bad capacitors, which is too bad. But as I said, the Color wa the uh, black and white Sony Watchmans, the CRT-based ones, they're all very good, very reliable, and um, they're aging very well. Another sort of interesting thing about the particular CRT used in this Watchman model um, is that unlike a normal CRT, which uses what's called magnetic deflection, um, this model uses a CRT which uses partial magnetic deflection and partial electrostatic deflection. Now, uh, what does that mean? Aha! I knew this thing would come in handy someday. So, most, well, all, almost all CRTs used in television sets uh, use what's called magnetic deflection. So what you have is two sets of coils. Um, here you see one right here and uh, there's another coil right there and then probably the other set right there. So I think probably that's one set and then the little ones up here are the other set. When you run current through these coils, of course um, if you've ever done a the uh, classic, basic uh, electromagnetics experiment when you uh, wind a coil of wire and uh, you run current through that coil of wire, it creates a magnetic field around um, that coil of wire. So this works by the same principle. When you put um, current, electric current, through these sets of coils, um, they generate a magnetic field and that magnetic field um, controls where the electron beam generated by the electron gun goes. And the electron gun is of course right here. So the electrons shoot through and then they're translated by um, uh, the uh, the coils here. So they're they're moved up and down or left and right and of course this is done at an extremely high speeds to make the beam you know scan across and go down to make a TV image. And uh, yeah that's that's uh, in a nutshell electromagnetic deflection. It's just varying the current going through these sets of coils to tell the electron beam where to go at any one instance of time. With electrostatic deflection, now uh, oscilloscopes use entirely electrostatic deflection. So with electrostatic deflection, um, rather than using current running through coils to generate a magnetic field to move the beam, what you do is you apply um, a high voltage um, to, I, I actually don't know what it is, I'm not knowledgeable of electrostatic deflection, so I don't know if it's a sort of a probe or an electrode placed at this point, but you use a high voltage um, 
to electrostatically um, deflect the beam. So the beam is going through and then when it, when it comes across this electric field, so instead of a magnetic field, it's an electric field. Um, when the beam hits this electric field, um, it's translated in a certain direction depending on the strength and um, polarization or whatever of that electric field. So that's electrostatic deflection. This TV uses partial electromagnetic deflection and partial electrostatic deflection. Probably, probably something like the horizontal is electromagnetic and the vertical is electrostatic or the other way around, but I'm not really sure. Um, but yeah, that's unique to this one model of Watchmen. The other CRT Watchmen's um, just had electromagnetic deflection like a normal um, TV tube. So now that I think of it, it's probably possible that the reason for redesigning the screen such that it's tilted and curved, that might have had something to do with the switch from um, partial electrostatic deflection to total electromagnetic deflection. So perhaps that's the reason. So this was a very innovative miniature TV um, when it came out. Um, so what was it competing against at the time? Well, it, it was competing with the aforementioned Panasonic sets that um, uh, had the post-it stamp, post-it, the postal stamp sized screen with the magnifier on them. Uh, Casio at this time would have been coming out with their first um, black and white LCD based TVs. And there was another TV on the market um, that was supposed to beat the FD210 to the market, but it uh, didn't. Um, that TV was designed by Sir Clive Sinclair of Great Britain. It was the Sinclair TV80, also called the FTV1. And uh, the Sinclair TV80, um, Sinclair was trying to beat Sony to the market. He didn't. Uh, he lost by over a year, I think. The, F the, uh, the TV80 didn't come out until 1983. Um, but interesting about the TV80 was it also used a flat CRT display. Um, a bit different from Sony's, where Sony, Sony's uh, tube has the electron gun firing um, vertically towards the screen. The TV80 has the electron gun firing sideways onto the screen. And uh, yeah, uh, Sinclair tried to beat Sony to the market with his... Uh, flat CRT based TV and uh, not only did he not be the first to do it but his TV was an absolute commercial failure. It relied on a proprietary um, lithium battery um, that would last something like 15 or 20 hours of use or maybe it was less than that I don't remember but it would last a long time but the battery was like 20 bucks a pop which was a lot for a battery back then so it suffered a fate similar to the Burgess Safari Light. It took special batteries that were very expensive and and nobody wanted to spend all their money on batteries to keep their TV80 going. So it sold, I think, only 15,000 units, whereas this sold, I don't know how much, but it would have been on the order of tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of units. And yeah, it was a total failure. Clive Sinclair lost a ton of, ton of money on it. He spent $4 million developing it and didn't even begin to recoup that money from the sales of the TV80. So too bad. Um, but yeah, Sony, uh, Sony won with their unit. So at this point, I'll stop talking about this thing and start showing it. Um, this is a really cool looking device. Very, um, very classy looking and very high quality feeling. While most of the casing of the TV, the back and the sides is plastic like you'd expect, this front face is actual metal, not metal coated plastic, um, just metal. And that's really, really nice feeling. With that said, there is one not so nice feeling about the TV and that's that the sides, um, when you squeeze the sides, the plastic bends quite a lot. It feels very squishy and um, I almost wonder if that crack um, could have been from someone squeezing it as they picked it up. Um, other than that, the only other thing I can think of is that this was probably dropped and that's what caused this crack. Which is, it's very impressive that this thing survived a drop. That's usually the main mode of failure for these things. Obviously, 
Um, if you drop one of these, it's going to very likely destroy the CRT because, of course, CRT is glass and parts of it are delicate. Um, so you wouldn't expect something like that to survive a drop, but um, by the looks of it, this one possibly did, which is quite impressive. Um, but yeah, you've got this beautiful, beautiful brushed metal um, Watchman silk screened on there. Very nice. And when you look here, there you've got the tuning dial. Very cool 80s look. Right there you'll see when we turn it on, that's a green power LED. This is the only Watchman, I think, with a power LED. They omitted it on future models. Mine's still got the It's a Sony sticker on it. Um, I always chuckle a bit when I see one of these stickers because it sounds like, um, you know, when you'd say, it's a boy or it's a girl, it's a Sony, you gave birth to a television set. Congratulations. Um, Sony emblem there, also metal, very, very nice. Speaker is located right here. Um, not as loud um, as future Watchmen models. Um, and you only turn the volume dial up halfway or so before it distorts and if you turn it up any louder it doesn't actually get louder it just gets more distorted so um, that's something they improved in future Watchmen models but it's passable nonetheless and of course this has the original lanyard on it still and there's a DC input jack 6 volts DC center negative I can't stress this enough. Um, normally an AC adapter that would fit in there would be center positive. This is center negative. All these early Sony Watchmans, they are center negative. So take great care in that if you want to run your Watchman on an AC adapter. Because um, most 6 volt AC adapters you find, they'll be center positive. I don't know if these things will break if you put center positive uh, power into them, but I certainly wouldn't want to try out, and I don't want anybody to break their Watchmen from it either, so do take care. And uh, looking on the other side, we've got a power switch here, and you can see um, there's two settings here, um, sound and TV. In sound mode, um, the TV is still powered on, and you, you can still hear what's being broadcast. However, the CRT is not powered. So, if you don't want to look at it, if you just want to listen to your TV program, you turn it on sound mode. Um, it uses significantly less battery life. Not all Watchmen's had this, but a lot of them did, and, and it's quite a neat feature. Looking on the back, we've got the info stickers. There you can see model FD210, flat black and white TV, 6 volts average, 1.8 watts, and it does use four AA batteries. And of course, it was made in Japan. Very nice. Here's something else that's, um, I forget if I mentioned this. Um, this is a stand for propping up the TV on a table. Um, or whatever, and uh, it is partially broken. When I first got this thing, I didn't know it was broken, and, and I couldn't get this stand to work, and I had no idea how you were supposed to use it. Well, it turns out, if you unclip it from the retaining clips here, this edge is supposed to be bonded to this edge. You can see there the broken plastic. So this is normally supposed to be like this, and when you unclip the stand, it'll flip down a boat like that. And uh, then you've got your stand. Um, but this is broken, so I, I can't use it. Um, most, if not all, FD210s I've ever seen on eBay have a broken stand. Um, I would say that's an inherent design flaw. Um, subsequent Watchmen have a totally different stand design, a much simpler one, and it's far better and far more reliable. So that's something they improved as well. But I gotta say, for being, you know, a proof of concept more than anything else, this was a very good TV. Um, and later Watchmen's only got better. Um, except in the way of, of course, image quality, like I said, with that change in the CRT design. Um, CRT uh, image quality became poorer, which is too bad. Um, your battery compartment, is right here. Flip that up, four AA batteries. Run it for several hours. Um, it, it really does have a very good run time on four AA batteries. Manufacture date, December 1982. And it complies with 
uh, Canada Part 2 regulations, GRR, I'm not sure, or is that GAA? No, it's GRR. I'm not sure what that stands for. Uh, I would assume this was sold in the United States. I bought it from the United States. Um, I just assume any no, all North American equipment um, has to have, you know, a sticker citing compliance with Canada's own regulations. I see a lot of modem cards that have a uh, have a sticker saying that it was it was uh, approved by Industry Canada. So that just must be something the government of Canada makes even American equipment have. On the top of the unit, that's where most of your controls are. There's your antenna. I will pull it out. There's the antenna. And uh, that just pushes down. Slots inside it very nicely. We've also got a 3.5mm external antenna jack. That's very useful these days. Of course, being obviously an analog TV, I, I say obviously, but um, it's kind of sad sometimes um, you look at um, pictures or videos of one of these and someone, you'll have that one guy who posts a comment asking if it can pick up digital channels. I don't know, does anything from 1982 pick up digital ch channels? I don't think so. But anyway, the external antenna jack is very nice these days because unless you own one of those blonder tongue television, low power television transmitters, which I do want to get someday, um, the external antenna jack is your best bet for getting a signal into this, so that's very nice. And uh, VHF, UHF switch. And uh, there's your volume control knob. Let's see if I can get a focus on that. And, uh, yep, volume control knob, very nice. Six is really about the highest it's practical to go. Once you start getting any higher, it just starts distorting more. It doesn't really get any louder. You do have a headphone jack, though. I don't remember if... Um, it's one or two channel. Um, um, what I mean by that is I think possibly when you put stereo headphones, when you plug stereo headphones into this, you'll only get sound out of the left side, but I don't remember if it's that way on this unit. And your tuning knob, of course, and uh, you can see the tuning dial moving. The knobs have these actual metal uh, metal accents on them, which is very nice. I think it's uh, very classy looking and, and quality feeling. And uh, yeah, I think that's the grand tour of this thing. So the only thing left to do is turn it on. I'll turn it on right now. No signal going into it, of course. And there you go. So, um... Oh, and if I move the switch down to sound mode, you can see it stays powered on. You can hear the static, but uh, no picture. And you can see it only takes a few seconds for the CRT to come to life. Another difference I just remembered sort of interesting about the CRT used only in the FD210 is that um, with other Watchman models, what happens when the batteries get low is that the raster starts vertically shrinking, your picture starts shrinking vertically, and eventually it gets to a point where it's just a, a thin line on the display, and it's too dim and blurry to see anyway. It gets dimmer and blurrier as the batteries die, and, um, and that's it. Well, with this thing, it behaves totally differently when the batteries start to die. Um, the raster does not shrink at all. Um, it just gets dimmer, and the contrast gets lower. So um, it gets to a point where when the batteries are low, things that are black do not appear black anymore. They just appear gray. And things that are white don't appear white. They also appear as gray. So it gets to a point where the contrast just gets lower and lower. And then there's a point where you can't discern things anymore. But the raster stays full size, which I think that's a nicer behavior mode for low batteries. I think it makes it uh, easier to watch until the batteries are totally dead. So... What I'll do is I'll set this up, find something to put a signal into this thing, and uh, we'll uh, have a little watch, see how the picture looks and how the sound is. And then I've got a GT710 that I just bought that I've got to do something with. But uh, if this does replace the 710, I do have a plan for the 710. 
as you can see, it's, well, first of all, it's a low-profile card. It's a very tiny card, and the connector on it doesn't even expand. So here I'm just playing some video that's on my camcorder tape that you've already seen. Um, kind of a silly setup I have here. How this is working is um, I'm just using the video capture setup that I've been doing for my 8mm um, video transfer job that I've been doing. So this camcorder's running into the composite input of the DVD recorder and then the DVD recorder is going from the composite output to the composite input of the VCR and then the coax output of the VCR is coming into the TV through the external antenna jack and the TV is tuned to channel 3 and uh, if you look at the image here as you can see very very good um, it's very crisp there's a really nice amount of resolution the beauty of a black and white CRT is that you have an extremely high resolution it's pretty much limited only by the grain of the phosphor and the um, you know, sort of the quality of the electronics driving the CRT. Um, it, it's really nice, very sharp, um, easy to read small text. Um, you know, LCD TVs from the 80s and even the 90s, it's impossible to read small text just because the resolution is too low, but on a watchman like this, it's it's very easy. And you can see the contrast is nice, and the geometry is just excellent. Like I said, way nicer than later Watchmen's. Um, so you have very, very nice, and of course the color of the phosphor is nice, a nice paper white. And um, yeah, very good. Sounds another story. This is literally as loud as I can get it. That was turned up all the way to 10. Um, now granted, the batteries in this are probably starting to get down there, and maybe that's part of the reason the sound is so bad. Um, but I don't have any better batteries here to test with. But yeah, not terribly loud nonetheless. It's a great card for that. Um, I've been running folding at home recently. And yeah, the speaker's pretty tinny and stuff like that. And um, I believe the speaker actually fires towards the side, um, but they just put the grills on the front for show. But yeah, w what it lacks in audio quality, it certainly makes up for in video quality, it's just excellent. And the tuning is really good. Um, I find um, my FD30 and another Watchman I have, which I'll make a video of in the future, both of them have really finicky tuning, but this one's really nice, really stable. If I, I turn the dial here... You can see um, the the um, uh, basically the the bandwidth for the audio is very wide. You can tune a very wide um, range and still get the audio perfectly in tune, and the uh, the video tuning is very decently in range as well. Um, this is in stark contrast to another one of my Watchmen's where you actually can't get the video and the audio perfectly tuned. You can either have perfect video and staticky audio or perfect audio and staticky video and perhaps that's due to age, aging components, stuff's gone out of calibration. Um, but yeah, this thing is just perfect despite being older than my other two Watchmen's. And um, I just can't get enough of that display. What excellent quality. Very nice CRT. It's nice and bright. It's very sharp. Um, like I said, Sony didn't even put contrast and brightness controls on here. Somehow it, it doesn't need it. Um, but the brightness and contrast is just impeccable. Um, and the sharpness is just excellent. And the geometry is very, very good. Um, if I can find them, I will put up some pictures here of some test patterns that I ran into this and you can see just how nice and straight the geometry is um, with those test patterns and how nice the contrast is. 
So yeah, this is <laughs> by far become my my fa the favorite of my three Watchmen's and all my portable TVs in general. Um, it's just not only is it super cool, but it actually has really nice function to boot. Um, very very nice. One last thing before I wrap up this video is um, I remember the very first thought that came to my mind when I excitedly got this from the post office and opened it up was, wow, this is really big. Um, it's sort of funny. Things that I, you know, sort of covet personally for years and then finally get a hold of, I often am surprised by their size. I, I always imagine them to be either bigger or smaller than they were, but in this thing's case, it was a lot bigger and heavier than I imagined it to be. Um, not only for uh, reasons of how I imagined it to be in my mind, but because it actually is a lot larger than other Watchmen's. For example, the FD-30 here, um, you can see it's quite a bit larger than that. And it's a lot heavier as well, but I like that. I like large, I like heavy. Um, so, totally, uh, totally cool with this. So. Yeah, that's really, really cool. So that is, I think, about all there is to show of the Sony Watchman model FD210 miniature portable TV from uh, 1982. Um, man, what a cool device! And I'm really, really happy that I get to uh, that I get to own it. Um, like I said, I wanted one of these for years when I first discovered. Um, that the Watchmen and TVs like it existed. This was the model I wanted, but of course they they always sold for just money that was out of my budget. So I got the FD30, which is a lot more easily attainable and more cheaply attainable model. But uh, yeah, I finally have one now and I'm super happy. Um, what a cool piece of of uh, vintage technology and, and very historical as well. So like I said, if you want one of these, um, at the time of filming this, there's none on eBay, which sort of surprised me. Usually there's one or two at any given time. But a working one, expect to pay $50 to $75 unless you get lucky like I did. If you want just any CRT Watchmen, if you don't mind that it's not this model, um, you're in luck. eBay is flooded with Sony Watchmen's. Every model you can imagine almost and um, super cheap as well. The FD20, the FD30, the FD40, um, the FD10, the FD2, they are all super common, super cheap, and they're all reliable. I mean, you never see broken ones show up on there. And, um, you know, if it turns on, if the display lights up and the uh, and the raster fills the whole screen, given that the batteries are good, then the whole TV probably works perfectly. And um, cheapest, most common one to get would be the FD10. Um, the FD30 is a cool model because it has an AM FM stereo radio built into it. Um, the FD40 is cool because it's got a big four inch display. They're all cool, you know, pick your poison, whatever features you like, you'll find a watchman that fits exactly that. Um, the FD-10, I would say, is the cheapest, most common one to find. They were the most popular Watchmen ever because they were very cheap. They had a retail price of like $40 or something like that. They were sold in in bubble packs, like plastic bubble packs, like cheap electronics usually are. That's how cheap Sony was able to make and sell them. So they're super common and um, equally just as fine. And they're, they're a bit newer too. They're from the late 80s, early 90s, so the FD-10 is um, probably the easiest and cheapest one to get, and it's quite small as well, based on the same 2-inch screen, but um, it's a lot smaller. Um, speaking of price, retail price on this unit was $350 in 1982, United States. Adjusted for inflation, that's almost $900 US dollars in today's money, so this was not cheap, but um, Obviously, Sony was able to make them very cheap to manufacture eventually with models, especially like the FD-10 that sold for um, a price that even children could get one at with a saved up allowance if they wanted to, which was pretty cool. So that's it for the FD-210. Um, thank you very much for watching. I hope this video wasn't too long. That's always sort of a concern when I make stuff like this, but I'm always really proud to be able to go into detail 
on stuff like this that nobody else has bothered to do. So I hope you enjoyed, and as always, I will see you next time.